you know the the usual stuff. Yeah. Okay, let me see if we're online. Yeah, I just got a notification on YouTube. Okay, good. So let me see here. How's your Christmas Eve going? Pretty well. Pretty well. Um. Yeah, just went and got some food. That's about it. <laughs> Does your kids open presents today or tomorrow? Uh, they opened one present this morning. Okay. Yeah, we um, we cheat, and our kids have opened all their presents already. Have they? Yeah. <laughs> so they can spend the rest of today and tomorrow playing with their presents. And then tomorrow we'll do stuff like um, look at Christmas lights around the neighborhood. What else? Gingerbread, making gingerbread cookies and that sort of thing. Right. Cool. Okay, so I want to find something that I found today on five main reasons why some say that Jesus didn't even exist. And you tell me if you agree with them. Okay, so the number one reason is, oh yeah, this is the one I always bring up, that no first century scholar evidence whatsoever points to the actual existence. So there's no evidence, uh, contemporary evidence for Jesus whatsoever. And I've... Some, some will claim that, um, that Paul was a scholar and Paul references Jesus. Uh, yeah, but again, if we, if we look at writings from 0 to 33, like during the life of Christ, there's nothing, right? That's right. So everything is post that. I remember when I was in Sunday school asking um, <laughs> the class, why do you think Jesus never wrote anything? Have you ever asked that question? Yeah, and you know there are many people who could write at that time. I mean, of course, it was far, far less than what there are now. But for such a important figure in history, it does seem rather surprising him not to. The one thing that I don't like about, um, or the one thing to be aware of, is that when it comes to scholars of the time referencing Jesus, the question that you need to ask um, depends on what type of Jesus you're talking about. So, yeah. so Christians, for the most part, um, believe in the biblical Jesus, who is a very grandiose figure um, who, you know, did miracles and um, his word of his fame spread far and wide and his life was accompanied by events that were very um, apparent and very clear to the people surrounding him and very, like, obviously important and obviously influential. Um, but that's, for the most part, not the Jesus that historians talk about. And so when it's pointed out that no scholars, um, no contemporary scholars reference Jesus, um, that is not very expected on the biblical Jesus, but it's pretty expected if Jesus was really just a um, small figure um, who didn't really do much and wasn't very well known. Yeah, it's... Um the Jesus as described by the Gospels, by far the vast majority of historians say do, does not exist. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I agree with that. I think the most, well at least um, the secular historians and even critical 
historians who are Christians would probably agree with that, yeah. Yeah, and that's one thing that always bothers me about William Lane Craig when he comes out and says the vast majority of historians say that, number one, Jesus existed, he died on a cross, went into a tomb, rose again, and then ascended to heaven. Like, no, the majority of historians do not say that. Only basically fundamental historians, fundamental Christian historians say that. And yeah, so there, there have been a lot of secular historians that have been convinced by the idea that there was an empty tomb because they see that as like a necessary component to explain why followers would claim that he was resurrected. Um, but, you know, there are pretty prominent historians who have been convinced out of that position despite holding it, like, for example, Bart Ehrman. Um, but, yeah, it does bother me when he says those sorts of things too because I don't think it's really representative of historians or at least biblical scholars. It's definitely not representative of historians because historians... Um, by and large, don't really pay any attention to those kind of claims because they think it's just the same kind of, in the same class of claims as Romulus or, um, you know, any other historical figure that there's very scanty evidence for. I'm going to bring up, um, where is it? Some names of historians living at the time that. So these are a, a list of historians that lived, let's say, between 0 and 100 AD that were silent about the historical Jesus. Now, do you want to explain, like, I'm going to use 0 to 100 AD or 0 to 33 AD. Are you, do you, are you aware of when those time designations even came into being? Um, it was quite a bit later, right? Yeah. It I wasn't until, like, maybe, was it even past, like, the first millennium? No, it wasn't past the first millennium. I think it was around 500 AD. 500, okay. So at 500 AD, someone said, I'm writing this in 500. <laughs> and just arbitrarily said, okay, we're going to mark 500 years prior to when I'm writing this as zero. And, um... I think someone can fact check me on that in the chat, but I think that is correct. Yeah, I, could, I honestly don't trust my memory on that. Oh, this is pretty fuzzy, isn't it? But here's a list of, I don't know, 20 or so historians who, most of these are Jews and Greeks who lived during Jesus's time when Jesus lived, these historians were alive when Jesus was alive and they wrote nothing about Jesus. So when, I don't know, wasn't, there was a huge earthquake when Jesus died. The temple was torn in two when Jesus died. People came out of the graves when Jesus died. When Jesus was the born, temple yeah, yeah. Uh, when Jesus was born, Herod apparently had the, all the, um, newborn Jewish sons killed, or no, all the Jewish boys killed, right? Yeah. Is it just Jews or all the boys? Uh, I don't actually remember. Is that in Luke's account of... Yeah, I think so. So what other major events happened? Um, you know, the zombies coming out of the graves. The, and... Oh, the, the uh, worldwide darkness. Did you mention that? No, I haven't mentioned that. No. <laughs> um, so here's some pretty major historical events that any one of these 20 or so historians could have wrote about, and they did not. Why? If they really happened. Yeah. And I think that that's a great question for, um, for somebody who believes the accounts told in the Gospels. Um, it's not a very, like I was saying before, I don't really think it's that convincing when it comes to, um, historians debating whether or not he existed as a historical figure, because none of them are really proposing that those events happened. But 
I'm getting a bit of an echo. It might be from me. But... Let me turn it down a bit. Okay, so... But it's a great point. Like, if you believe in the biblical Jesus, you have something to explain. Um, you have something to give account for. You need to... Um, I, maybe a plausible explanation as to why there are so many um, people of the time who could have written about those events but didn't. Um, maybe what you would appeal to is that... Um, that they did actually write about it, but for some reason it wasn't preserved. Um, this is this definitely happened. Um, there are lots of things that were written around the time for which we have no record of because, and, and we know that they were written because we say, for example, have the titles of the books, um, but we don't actually have the contents. Um, the di difficulty with that excuse is um, we do actually have um, good reason to think that Christians of those time periods would have referenced those in works that do survive that were written by Christians. Um, and yeah, but you know. so yeah, the number one point is there's at least 20 historians that we know of that wrote during Jesus's life, and yet they wrote nothing about Jesus or any of them major events that happened during that time that the Gospels say happened. That should be a huge question mark, and I think this is something that a lot of Christians don't really think about, don't even... Um, like, I was talking to a guy the other day, I think he was totally oblivious to the fact that there was zero evidence of Jesus that was written during his lifetime. And why didn't, if Jesus existed, why didn't he write anything? Um, and second point is that the the very earliest writings we have about Jesus, it's not from the Gospels, it's from Paul. And so Paul, if we were to get into a time machine, let's assume, I'm not even convinced Paul, the Apostle Paul exists. <laughs> um, do you think he exists? Uh, existed? Um, I haven't, I think in the last conversation that we had about this stuff, I mentioned that I wasn't that familiar with um, the arguments against his existence or why people even propose that, given that we have letters written by somebody who claims to be Paul. Um, but I'm not 100% certain. I do believe that Paul was a historical figure and that he wrote um, a number of epistles, a number of letters to churches that we still have. I mean, it's worth pointing out that we also have letters that we know weren't written by Paul yet claim to be. Um, yeah. There's a pretty solid consensus in, among historians about that fact. Now, some people say, I, oh, I, I forget the guy's name, but there is some one hypothesis that the Apostle Paul never existed, but really it was, uh, was it Tiberius? There was some... I think Simon Magus or something? There was I some, don't know. There was some Greek guy who was from Tarsus, uh, was a persecutor like Paul was, and that Paul's earliest letters were basically written by him. Hmm. So do you think, um, here's a question, given the contents of the letters, I mean, it is a little bit unusual that they claim to be by Paul, but you're saying that they're not. Do you think it matters a lot if they weren't? Because the thing is, is that Paul is not very connected to Jesus in the first place. Um, he, well, at least the the historical Jesus that people claim exists, like he didn't know him um, in flesh and blood. I mean, it's claimed in his letters that uh, Jesus revealed himself to Paul. Um but it's not like he was a disciple of Jesus or he, he and he even in fact never claims um, that he knew people who were disciples that like sat at the feet of Jesus or anything like that. He does claim to have met Peter um, and uh, James, but 
he never says of them that they were disciples. He was. He says that they were apostles. But yeah, do you think that Paul existed? I don't know. I if if he did exist, it's clear to me based on the earlier writings. So Colossians, Galatians, First and Second Thessalonians, First uh, and Second Corinthians. Uh, what else? What, so I don't think Colossians. I think Colossians is a forgery, isn't it? Oh yeah, you're right. Uh, Galatians, I meant. Um, yeah. So first, second Corinthians. So there's seven oh, books. Like, there's seven books that were written before the Gospels, and if you read them chronologically, you'll notice something very interesting, and that is, Paul has no idea who Jesus's parents were. He probably wouldn't know who Mary and Joseph were. He knows nothing of the specific miracles that. Jesus did on his ministry. The only thing Paul knows about Jesus is that he had some type of death and and resurrection. So j just to push back on that a little bit, um, I would phrase that differently because I don't know if we can claim that he had no knowledge of things that he fails to mention. Right, that's and true. The, the the important thing to point out is that he doesn't, um, whether by having no motivation or um, whether by not knowing, um, he doesn't mention any details about specific miracles Jesus performed on earth or any kind of like names of his parents or his um, genealogy or or really even that he was a teacher on earth I, I think you're right about that but then the question has to be asked why why doesn't he mention these things why is it the le the first letters that historians say are not forged uh, why the silence about that the historical Jesus yeah so the th things that I hear claimed are that he effectively had no occasion to do so um, that what he was trying to convey to the churches he was sending letters to were more um, details about um, church teaching how to act as um, as members of the church, um, how to pastor, and that for whatever reason um, there weren't any um, details about Jesus's life that he thought relevant to mention. Um, but, you know, so they try to make the claim that the content and the context of the letters doesn't demand mention of the kind of facts that we're thinking of, because they say that Jesus, uh, sorry, Paul, in writing to these churches, was not writing a biography of a man that he knew of, but instead were writing about particular issues that concern those churches at the time. Now, um, yeah, well, maybe you want to give some comments as to why you think that's not a very reasonable claim. Yeah. Well, no, one, one thing I've heard is that um, they were getting older. If the story is true, they're, get, they're aging, they're about to die, and they realize, oh, Jesus said he'd come back in our generation, but he hasn't. Oops, we better start writing some of this stuff down about who Jesus was and what he did when he lived. And so that's why the Gospels wrote more of the historical account. When Paul was writing, I think the thought was, oh, Jesus is going to return in our lifetime. So he didn't bother writing about the historical Jesus. That's what I've heard from some Christians. Yeah, and so that's that's a reason why he wasn't writing a biography right but it doesn't explain why there were no facts about jesus that paul knew that were relevant in the arguments that he made because paul um you know he hits on many different issues like things regarding morality things regarding money things regarding marriage um things regarding behavior within the church things regarding um gifts of the spirit and how the holy spirit works and why is it that when discussing these topics 
some of which Jesus actually, at least according to the Gospels, directly spoke about why in his argument to um, these people didn't that come up? Why didn't he talk about what Jesus said as opposed to giving his own argument? What I have up on the screen right now is Philo, uh, I forget which Philo this is. There's a bunch of Philos. Philo of Alexandria. Yeah. I think. He uh, lived, I think, 30 BC roughly to 60 AD. No, maybe not that late. But anyhow, he wrote at least decades before Colossians, the logos of the living God is the bond of everything, holding all things together. Now imagine 30, 40, 50 years later, Colossians, you read, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Um, it, it seems like it's a, it's a lifting, a borrowing <laughs> of Philo's writings. And, yeah, and there are, um, there are other passages, because as I pointed out before, I don't actually think Colossians is um, an authentic letter of Paul, but there are other um, passages in Paul which I think show um, a belief in a pre-existent divine being named Jesus, um, who, yeah, who, like, has particular titles given to him, like firstborn and stuff like that, um, and that that parallel very strongly with Philo's works. So it seems that either, like, there was a common influence on Philo and Paul, or Philo was an influence on Paul. I mean, I'm not too sure which. I would suggest that it was probably the former, because I think what Philo writes, um, there is, I think it's reasonable to believe that some of that philosophy existed um, outside of Philo, like that Philo wasn't the sole originator of that. Yeah, and Richard Carrier, basically, his theory is that if you look at the first letters of Paul, the ones that most historians say are not forgeries, there's only a couple passages where you could say that Paul is actually talking about a physical real person. And even that's contested. It's more like Jesus is viewed as this spiritual being who died in us, in us, was it third heaven, second heaven? That there's actual places, not on earth, but in between the earth and, and the top heaven, there's different heavens. And Jesus was in one of those heavens. And uh, that's where he died and rose again, not here on earth. And there might be some Christians listening to that and saying, what in the world are you talking about, Doug? But if you study the, the culture and the history of that day, what I just said wasn't bizarre at all. That that's, was common knowledge that there was different uh, what's the, environments, different states of being. There was, They're like con concentric heavens yeah. above in which there were believed to be copies of things that we see in this world. Um, for example, many Jews believed in like a celestial temple that existed in the heavens. Um, it's quite a foreign concept for us now to believe of like solid things um, and, you know, physical things existing in these different layers. But back then, it was actually quite a reasonable belief. Um, some even, there is some evidence even that um, some people believe Adam was buried in heaven. Um, and to be buried in heaven sounds a bit strange to our notion, but um, apparently people believe those kinds of things back then. Yeah, the first heaven is basically the Earth's atmosphere. The second heaven is outer space. Uh, Deuteronomy 17.3, Jeremiah 8.2, Matthew 24.29. The third heaven is where God and the holy angels reside. Deuteronomy 10.14, 1 Kings 8.27, Psalm 115. So we have three heavens. And Paul was caught up in which one? Remember that? Is it in 2 Corinthians 12? I think Paul says, no, that's, that's not a forgery. Although um, we don't quite know whether or not it was Paul, because he doesn't actually refer to himself. He says, like, somebody I know, or I can't oh, remember exactly yeah. his phrasing. And, like, you know, some scholars, like, think that, 
you know, that's a, it, it's a story about himself, but for whatever reason, he's not referencing himself as the one experiencing it. But. Yeah, he says, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in body, I do not know, or out of the body, God knows, such a man was caught up to the third heaven. And I know such a man, whether blah, 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 into paradise, inexpressible words, which a man is not permitted to speak. So this is a, some say this is Paul having a vision of being up into the third heaven, which would be where the God and the angels are, according to that other thing I read. So, yeah, if this Paul was a real guy who actually wrote this, he had some weird and bizarre visions. Hmm. And what does it tell you that these people believed these kinds of things? Like what, I mean, one thing I'm interested in is um, when you learn that people of this time, I mean, not, not entirely, like not all people, of course, but, you know, many people of this time had this worldview, which we know now um, to be probably false, and they came to believe it and they passed on experiences which we have reason to doubt. What does that tell us about them as thinkers? What does it tell us about them and their epistemology, the way they went about finding out what was true? Um, my difficulty in believing the claims of early Christians is that I see evidence that makes me doubt they were very reliable reasoners um, it makes me doubt they had good reasons for their belief, despite it being true that they believed it. Mm -hmm. Even today, we see many people who believe things that we don't think they have good reason for. Like Christians watching in the stream will agree that there are many people of different religions out there who don't have good reasons for believing what they do, because what they believe is false. And I wonder... I would like to get a better picture of um, how superstitious these people were, how readily they believed the claims of their fellow man, um, and, you know, how often they questioned. Yeah, well, it's... Imagine someone coming up to you and saying, hey, Doug, uh, Cam, I had this amazing vision the other night, and I think it was from God. No, 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 I know it was from God. It was X, Y, and Z. And I'm going to write this down because I think these are God's words. Now, most Christians today would hear something like that and say, no, I highly doubt that. <laughs> but mm. this is... Some Christians would believe it. <laughs> yeah, some Christians would believe it. Some yeah. Pentecostals, I bet. But this is exactly what happened to Paul. So why is it that you take a very similar type experience and backdate it 2,000 years and put it in a book, it now is God's word. But today, no way is that, you know, most people would say that's not a reliable method. You know, someone just telling you they had this experience, this vision, whatever, a dream, um, even a hallucination. No, no, you can't, you know, let's be serious. It could be from God, but we know people have visions and experiences and hallucinations all the time, and that doesn't necessarily mean it's from God. In fact, it could be from Satan if you believe in the devil. Why is it that people just automatically assume that what happened to Paul was from God? Hmm. Yeah, I, th I think it's a great question. I, I, I wonder if the fact that it's in a book that people have revered for such a long time has an influence, and the fact that it's really old, um, you know, and so many people have been convinced by it. Um, it's, it, you know, makes people ask a question, oh, well, you know, have, you know, how have we all been so duped? Um, you know, why is it that everybody believed it? Now, I don't think that those are good reasons, but I wonder if that's part of it. I know when I became a Christian, I, like, approached the Bible with a kind of reverence that I no longer hold for it. I, I saw it as having authority 
because of its place as an ancient text. But the reality is, is that I now have other books on my bookshelf which contain ancient writings, and I don't approach those with that, that kind of reverence. And the claims made within them, I treat with the same kind of skepticism I treat with the person down the road who claims they had an experience of a divine being. And I think this is exactly why Christianity is dying. Yes, dying in the United States, especially because of things like the internet, access to information very quickly. People, like when I was a kid, there was, it was almost a default position that the Bible was held up and revered. That default position is eroding quickly. That people just say, oh, you know, okay, this is the Bible, but so what? That doesn't mean that everything in it is true. People are starting to think like that. And that never used to be the case, at least when I was young. Like, uh, we would never question it. No, this is just God's word. So, uh, mm. so anyhow, yeah, I just want to review. Uh, first reason why some people say that Jesus never existed. And again, what we're talking about is the Jesus as described in the Gospels. Um, because there's 20 or so historians of that time who wrote nothing about Jesus, uh, extra biblical historians. There's silence, there's nothing, we have zero evidence, neither uh, physical or in written text form of any mention of Jesus at all from during his lifetime or even shortly thereafter. Uh, and then number two, the second reason why some people think Jesus never existed is that the very first mention of Jesus is from Paul. This first seven books that he wrote predate the Gospels, and even Paul doesn't really mention a physical Jesus. He mentions a more of a spiritual type Jesus. He does mention um, Jesus knew the brother, Brother James, and does refer to the twelve. Does he refer to the twelve in the first seven letters? Or is that later? Um. I think he says the apostles. I don't know if he says the 12. He might, he might have. Um, yeah. Or no, well, he does in 1 Corinthians 15 um, mention the apostles. Yeah. But although the, the brother of James part, uh, sorry, um, you said that Jesus mentioned that. But, no, I mean Paul, yeah. Yeah, Paul, um, Paul mentioned meeting... James, the brother of the Lord, when he also met with Peter. And there's debate among historians whether or not that's a reference to a brother who is, um, you know, an actual biological brother of a living historical figure. Um, I think that there's pretty compelling arguments to not see it as evidence for that. But, you know, there's a lot of disagreement there anyway. So those are the two main reasons so far that I have. Um, the third reason is that the New Testament stories don't even claim to be first-hand accounts. So you look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, they're written in the third person. Nowhere will you read, I saw this happen. Uh, so it's not a first-person account. They're anonymous, except for John. John's not anonymous, is it? No, I think it's anonymous. It is? Okay. I mean... It refers to um, towards the end of the book. Like, it doesn't come out at the beginning of John and say, I'm John writing blah, blah, blah. But yeah. towards the end, I think, like in chapter 21 or 23, it has like a kind of a, an indication that the person writing it is the person experiencing something in the text, like maybe the beloved disciple. I, I can't actually remember, but most um, historians that I've read don't think that John is a eyewitness account. Yeah, so, and this is, it is so weird, I, and I don't know how this happens, because I was in my probably early 30s until I finally figured this out, <laughs> that the Gospels are anonymous, we really don't know who wrote them, and they're written in the third person, and I remember thinking to myself, okay, think about the nativity scene. It's Christmas. Think about the birth of Jesus. It talked about in Luke and Matthew. Mark and John don't even mention it. Whoever wrote that, were, if they were actually Luke 
and Matthew, they wouldn't have been there at the nativity scene. They weren't even talked about even knowing Jesus until Jesus was an adult. So it's clear. Well, and Luke didn't even know Jesus either. Yeah, Luke and or Matthew. Least, you know, according to the tradition of who Luke was. They wouldn't have known Mary and Joseph. They, so in other words, the bottom line is you would, they still wrote about it without seeing it. So if they can write about the birth of Jesus without seeing it, why couldn't they have written, wrote all the gospel narrative without seeing it? Well, and they contradict each other in the birth accounts as well. Which well, is, I'd be careful yeah. using the... I, I've refrained using <laughs> the word contradictory. To me, okay, they give different stories. You could yes. you, you could try to provide a kind of harmonization as, you know, to, to fit them together, but they definitely account different... Um, different stories, different elements. And, I mean, I would go so far as saying that they do contradict at least on the date of Jesus' birth. I don't think that they yeah. give a consistent account of when Jesus was born. But yeah. um, Well, let's talk about that. Uh, in Matthew, it says that Jesus was born um, at the time of Herod. Or is that Luke? Yeah. I think it's Matthew. Uh, I think it is Matthew. And because Luke's the one who talks about it with the census under right. Quirinius. So people say Herod died, King Herod died between minus three and minus one, and uh, or minus four and minus one. And um, then Luke talks about this census, and there's no census uh, talked about in history until 5 or 6 AD. So now we have a problem. Is it uh, Governor Quir Quirinius? Quirinius? Qu Quirinius, I think. Quirin oh, no. <laughs> I might be saying that wrong. <laughs> yeah. So we have a problem here. The problem is that either Jesus... Quirinius. Was, Quirinius. The problem is either Jesus was born around uh, minus three to minus one, or he was born four to six in there somewhere it's a big gap now the way christians get around that is saying well there could have been a census taken in minus one to minus three without it being recorded i mean <laughs> you would think a census by definition is a, a recording but we don't have record of it um that's basically the only out they have they can't say that king herod lived to 5 a.d that just won't fly that we have too much evidence to say that he died sooner than that mm. and I don't even really think it's an out because the, I mean, <laughs> at least on probabilistic grounds, we have very little, re like we have really no reason to think that um, a census would demand traveling to um, a place of origin. Yeah. Now, why <clears throat> this is, the theory is that the census was totally fabricated but there's a reason why it was fabricated. And it was to fit the prophecies together, to force them to come together, because incorrectly I'll add that the writer of Matthew, no, the writer of Luke thought, oh, the Old Testament prophesies a, a Nazarene. Uh, so the, the Messiah will be, come from the clan of the Nazarenes. So he, but mistakenly thought that means he had to come from Nazareth. And so they had to sort of put Jesus coming from Nazareth. But there's another prophecy that says that it would be in the line of King David, uh, born in Bethlehem. So how do we get a Nazarene, which really is in the Old Testament is talking about a family tribe and not a place. How do we get this person from Nazareth to Bethlehem? Oh, I know. Let's make a census that people who live in different who've moved away have to come back to their homeland and, um, and be registered, which there's no record in history of that ever happening. And so that's how Luke kind of took two prophecies and melded it into one by fabricating the census idea. I say fabricating. It could have happened, I will admit, but it seems doubtful. Um, mm. It's the more plausible explanation. Good reason to believe yeah, it. We have we don't have a good reason to believe that any of this actually happened, and it makes it is a plausible explanation that the writer of Luke was trying to fit two prophecies together. And keep in mind, Mark, the first gospel written, mentions none of this. 
it's just mm. silence from him. Yeah. So earlier you um, you mentioned like you put strong emphasis on the fact that the synoptic gospels at least were anonymous and that we didn't have a good reason to think that they were written by eyewitnesses due to the way that they um, narrate the story. I would say the most um, prominent reason why we shouldn't think of them as like eyewitnesses accounts is the fact that Mark um, is clearly the first written and Matthew and Luke very clearly adapt Mark's gospel um, for their own purposes in many places, but in many places also copying practically verbatim, um, sometimes literally verbatim. Um, And yeah, I, I think that that is a marker of somebody who wasn't an eyewitness. I mean, yeah. it would be a very strange thing if I experienced something that you also experienced and I cribbed from your account and made modifications that contradicted yours or at least appear to um, contradict yours um, and didn't write my own memory of the events from a first-person perspective. Yeah, um, whenever I hear Christians say that, well, of course, Doug, there's uh, similarities and even some word-for-word things from Mark, Matthew, to Luke, to even John, because it's God's Word. It's, It's the consistency shows that this is God working through many different people to tell a consistent story. But then when you talk about the inconsistencies, how Luke's nativity scene very as different than Matthew's well that just shows that you know it's different perspectives but it's still showing that this is God's word because we would be suspicious if it was exactly the same you notice the problem here no matter what you say what consistency proves it's God's word and inconsistency proves it's God's word they're they're just basically believing this is God's word no matter what yeah it comes back to that old um saying that you can't have it both ways But I wanted to say one thing about the contradiction. So if you're an atheist listening to this, and if you notice all the sort of differences in the birth story and the resurrection story, and you know they're there, like, was it one woman who went to the tomb, two, three, four, or more? Was it one angel at the tomb, one man, two men, two angels? Um, Who went to... uh, yeah, when what was, was Jesus on the cross? <laughs> what was said on the cross, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, or why have you forsaken me? Like there's, what, three or four last words of Jesus. All these problems, they're technically not contradictions. So don't I, I would recommend don't call them contradictions. But what I would highlight to a believer is that they have to resort to the maximum uh, hypothesis on each yeah. explanation. So when it says... When, when they're asked the question, well, how many women went to the tomb when Jesus rose from the dead? You always have to go with the big number. Because if you say one, well, they say, oh, the other Gospels just didn't mention the other three. So you always have to use the biggest kind of compilation of each individual story. So if you were to try to take Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and make one Gospel, you would all, that one Gospel would have all the biggest numbers in it. <laughs> it would have to. Yeah, but, yeah, and it will also have very, very interesting things like um, Jesus actually clearing the temple twice um, yeah. instead of just once, you know, despite the fact that the synoptics don't mention it happening twice and, um, you know, and one at the beginning of the ministry and one at the end and and all of these types of things. So it's like this mega gospel that kind of tells events in this way that makes every detail included and harmonized um, despite no individual account actually attesting to it. So there's, it, it's always... Um, the mega gospel that you create is not really corroborated by any one gospel. Um, 
it's quite strange. But then there are things that I consider like genuine contradictions, like that effectively there's n not really much meaning to the word contradiction if these don't count. Um, and of course, excuses will always be given. But the difficulty is that like when you have 10 unlikely and strained excuses for a text, you've got to be asking yourself, is it very likely that all of these excuses are true? Um, wouldn't it be more likely that like at least one of these excuses is false? Um, you know, or maybe more of them. <laughs> Maybe it's just the case that the individual gospel authors were trying to emphasize different things um, that were relevant to their church at the time, or they dis disagreed with previous gospel authors of what facts were relevant in Jesus, what facts were true. I'll just throw this up as an aside. Justin Martyr, he was one of the first Christian apologists ever, and he said in uh, somewhere in the early second century, when we say that he, Jesus Christ, our teacher, was produced without sexual union, was crucified and died and rose again and ascended to heaven, we propound nothing different from what you believe regarding the sons of Jupiter. Whether he really said that, I don't know, but... <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting quote. It, um... Sorry, I'm just grabbing a jersey. I'll be back in a moment. Okay. So when it comes to contradictions, my advice uh, when you're talking to a believer is don't go for the little stuff because they have solutions to every little contradiction you can think of. Um, you just look online and you can find Christians explaining away all these so-called contradictions. Uh, the big stuff which I think is the stuff that matters, is the contradictions of salvation. Uh, works versus grace. Uh, sovereignty versus free will. God being perfectly just and per perfectly merciful. God being um, omnibenevolent and omniscient and omnipotent at the same time. You, that is the major contradiction right there. Those three omnis, omni, how can you have a creature that's omnibenevolent, omniscient, and omnipotent at the same time? Um, and it's basically, you know, Sam Harris's, uh, well, he probably didn't say it first, but um, if, if there's someone suffering, God either doesn't care to help or cannot help or will not help, um, you can't be omnibenevolent and let a, a child die of uh, of cancer. Um, so I I personally believe that those attributes um, aren't so much contradictory as they are predictive of a different world, one that we don't live in. So maybe they are contra contradictory, like maybe they are incompatible or logically inconsistent, but. For me, they just contradict experience. Well, yeah, if you, are you talking about the difference between experiential contradictions and logical contradictions? Yeah, well, so um, some people claim that like the attributes of God are logically inconsistent. Um, and that, that may well be true, but when it comes to like omnibenevolence and omnipotence, I think the issue is more to do with the world that we discover ourselves to be in um, doesn't match what is predicted by a being that has those properties. Okay, so the reason why people think that Jesus, as described in the Gospels, never existed is because, number one, there's zero evidence of Jesus existing while he exists. There's no, we have nothing written down about Jesus while he was alive. Number two, the very first pieces of text that we do have about Jesus don't go into his biography, don't talk about Jesus being the person who does miracles, has a family, has friends. It's all pretty silent, silent about that sorts of things. 
and those are Paul's first seven letters, and then comes the Gospels later. Uh, number three, um, the Gospels are not uh, first-hand accounts. They're anonymous, written in the third person. We don't know who wrote them. Uh, number four, that there are inconsistencies even among the Gospels on so many things. And of course, Christians have solutions to each and every one. But at some point, I would think they get tired of over <laughs> always having to come up with a solution. And some of these solutions are, like there's one about the, which looks so much like a contradiction where Jesus says, take a walking stick or don't take a walking stick. I forget exactly where it's found. And I looked up the Christian solution to this problem, and it was like a, it must have been over 500 words, a full page of, of text trying to explain why that's not a contradiction. And then the last reason I have here is um, that modern scholars who claim to have uncovered the real historical Jesus depict widely different people. Um, like, who is Jesus? Even if he was a historical person, who was he? And um, even historians do not agree what this physical Jesus, who he is. Um, for example, uh, David Fitzgerald, he says, Jesus appears to be an effect, not a cause. Paul and the rest of the first generation Christians searched the Septuagint translation of Hebrew scriptures to create a mystery faith for Jews, complete with pagan rituals like the Lord's Supper. Gnostic terms in his letters, a personal savior God to rival those to the, in their neighbors in Egypt, Persia, uh, Rome. Uh, so he says that is Jesus sort of like the Jewish rabbi, or is he a uh, you know great teacher, or is he um, this meek and mild and gentle pacifist? Uh, almost political guy who's trying to change the government. It seems like historians really don't, they, they differ on, on what this Jesus' purpose was, why, what he actually did. I think there's only two things that they agree on, um, and that is that he was baptized by John, and, and the only reason why they agree on these two things is because it's, um, they have two different sources, and they view John and the Synaptic Gospels as one source. So the Synaptic Gospels are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John they put in a different category. And so they say between John and the other three Gospels, the only thing they agree on is that Jesus was baptized by John and that he was known as the King of the Jews and was crucified. And that's mm. it. And e even then, one of the arguments that they give for believing that he was baptized by John is an argument from embarrassment, which is, I think, logically fallacious. They argue that, like, the gospel authors wouldn't recount the detail that would be embarrassing to them, um, and that John baptizing Jesus would embarrass them. Um, but I happen to believe that mark or at least the author of mark wasn't embarrassed by that fact but yeah so should we try to come up with a theory an encapsulating theory that can explain who this jesus person was if he existed at all i'm, I'm going to give it a shot here this is my opinion and i could be totally wrong but i think there was trouble between the Jews, the Greeks, uh, or no, the Jews and the Romans. And uh, the Romans basically in the mid first century said, how are we going to deal with all these Jews? And around just before the destruction of the temple, maybe even after, they came up with this idea. Why don't we kind of come up with a new religion, a more pacifistic one, to calm these people down. And we will use the Old Testament as our sort of first, you know, if you have a movie with the sequels, it's, you know, the original movie, and this new religion is going to be the sequel to it. So a lot of what we can use, we can get out of the Old Testament. 
We can even use some of Greek literature, like the, like the Odyssey, Homer's works, and some other Greek mythology. And let's, let's make a screenplay. Let's make a passion play. And there was many passion plays of the, of the time. And maybe, and this is where I'm unclear about, but uh, they could have based it on a, a real charismatic figure guy who came out of the Essene movement, an apocalyptic movement. And uh, so they wrote this, this screenplay, loosely based on a real guy. And this is why you see almost a contortion of prophecies being fulfilled in the New Testament because they basically were scourging through the Old Testament looking for prophecies to fulfill. And not, not one of them is perfect. And... And I think this is how they came up with the gospel story. Now, Paul throws a wrench into this, a uh, big wrench. And so maybe they, instead of using this loosely real character out of the Essene movement, maybe they, they use Paul. And again, I'm assuming Paul even existed and uh, to create their nar narrative. One thing that always struck me was, you know the verse that says in the Gospels when uh, the Pharisees asked Jesus about whether or not they should pay taxes? <laughs> and Jesus says, yeah, render unto Caesar which is his. That's something a Roman would write in the government and high up, right? And so now they, they have, they're telling these poor people Give money to us. So if they actually wrote this, I, I thought that was kind of a, a little red flag. Of um, And then the other little red flags would be stuff like uh, James and John being referred to as the sons of Zebedee, uh, straight out of Greek mythology. Um, and then the, the terrible prophecies being fulfilled, like the prophecy out of Zechariah 9, 9, where I think Luke and Matthew differ on whether it was one uh, donkey or two, two colts walking into Jerusalem. They, they both, the writers kind of viewed the prophecy differently. They, they trans, translated it differently. And so... Matthew was the one that has two. Yeah. So it's almost like, okay, so they're writing this book, the, these books, and... Um, and these Greek scholars probably wrote these, uh, the, the New Testament, or the, um, the Gospels, and they, they had little differences in how they viewed the Old Testament Greek prophecies. And so um, that's, and you can see that in the New Testament, these, these small differences. Say another one was that um, Jesus would be born of a virgin. They got that from the Greek translation of the Hebrew, which translate it into virgin, but really the Hebrew Old Testament says just a young woman, but they made it into a virgin, which is more like the Greek mythology. <laughs> Noisy Splatter says Christianity was an inside job. <laughs> so I don't really believe any of that. <laughs> you don't? No. <laughs> um, so what's your theory? I think more on, along the lines of how carrier things um although i'm not totally sure that jesus didn't exist in the first place um i'm i would probably say that i'm more agnostic like, i'm more in like the kind of like 30 percent probability 40 percent probability that kind of category um like i have doubts and i think i have good reason to doubt but i'm not sure so I think, Paul, that wrench that you spoke of, I, I think is too big of a wrench. I, I think um, I, I think he, given the fact that he is the earliest writing about Paul, I, I think that, and the fact that we have, like, um, a very early um, high divine view of Jesus, um, like, I think that he and those he... Who, he was in communication with um, or the origin of the belief. I think that Jesus as a divine figure more came out of, um, came out of Jewish belief um, 
syncretistic Jew, Jewish belief. Um, well, one thing that's worth mentioning here is that people often make the claim that Jewish belief was very consistent and unified. Um, but the reality is, is that we have um, evidence that there was, you know, quite diverse Jewish beliefs, especially because of the fact that Jews had been um, exiled into different regions where they were influenced by different um, different religions. But in, but I think that my belief is that Paul's um, Christ is pretty much like the earliest version of Jesus. And he is like a divine being who provides salvation through his de death and resurrection. But couldn't, um, couldn't have the... And that the gospel authors later... Um, effectively like historicized what was a celestial being yeah and um, that that kind of goes with what i was saying like but but i don't think that it was perpetrated by the romans i think that there's like i, I think the evidence for that is pretty slim i think more the believers or like at least the gospel um the gospels matthew and luke i think come out of christian communities but i do think that mark is a um effectively what would i call it um like it's a, a giant allegory like a giant parable i i think i don't think that mark or like the author of mark really believed that he was writing historical events but i don't think that he was like commanded to by like some kind of roman conspiracy <laughs> or like you know that he was doing it for the purpose of creating like a pass a, a more um pacified religion to stop the conflict between jews and romans because i think that like that belief in um a more passive religion exists in the writings of Paul prior to the Gospels. And I actually think that Mark as a text actually re reflects Paul's early belief, albeit in an in a allegorical historical fiction way, more than what the later Gospels do. But anyway, you, you, you make comments now. <laughs> Well, but at some point, the Romans had to put their seal of approval to propagate the belief. Correct? I think that that happened much later, though. I think that there were, we have evidence of churches existing in different regions of the Roman Empire um, from a pretty early stage, and or at least, you know, through Paul. Um, and I don't think that in um, the empire, I don't think that there was any need for new ideas to be like officially propagated and blessed by like Roman authorities. Like it, there was quite plur plurist pluralistic beliefs in the time. Um, there were many different faiths and mystery religions and uh, that people followed including um the jewish beliefs and primarily what the romans were interested in is that you gave um that you gave like allegiance to the roman gods um jews didn't have to do that because they had like some kind of special relationship with the with uh, Ro the roman empire but um yeah, I mean, I, I don't think that it needs to be a conspiracy by people deliberately acting to create a religion to resolve conflicts. I think that that was more a, a natural organic manifestation of the fact that Jews had been in conflict with Romans um, for many years leading up to the first century. And um, efforts to overthrow Roman rule through force were unsuccessful. And I think that that naturally created an environment where it was very easy for people to conceive of ways in which um, Jews could become saved and Jews in their situation become um, 
you know, not no longer oppressive simply by claiming that God had effectively, you know, like saved them, um, regardless of the fact that the Romans were you... still ruling. But it, it's it seems clear to me that whoever wrote the Gospels, very scholarly people, high level Greek. Yeah, I definitely think that they um, had a very clear and obvious uh, Greek education. Like it's clear, well, at least in the case of Mark, it's clear that he had read works like Homer and that he had a very strong command of um, written Greek. And um, and same goes for Matthew and Luke. But, but the idea that only um, those in the, like an elite position being instructed by like some kind of Roman authorities had that education is just false. Like we know that like there was a lot of um, illiteracy in the time and it was more rare to be that educated, but like there's no doubt that people who weren't, um, <laughs> you know, in league with the, with the government. But, but, <laughs> Okay, here's my question. How many Jews at that time, literate Jews, were literate in Greek and many. Were, and but but at the same time would write about a Messiah who it's clear to Jews that Jesus was not the Messiah, the the majority of them. The educated well, ones. I, I think many, because like as you see from the Septuagint, which was written in what, like 177 BC or something like that, that, um, oh no, actually maybe it wasn't that quite that early, but um, the Septuagint, which is a translation of the Hebrew Bible, um, was written partly because of the fact that in, in the diaspora, there were many Jews who were better educated in Greek than they were in Hebrew um, or Aramaic. And the translation offered the ability for Greek-speaking Jews to be able to read their religious texts. So, but yeah, sorry, maybe I wasn't responding to the point that you made, but carry on. I'm just wondering why a highly intellectual, literate, fluent Greek-speaking Jew what is their motivation to write the Gospels? Well, I, I think that Matthew and, Mo uh, <laughs> Matthew and Luke represent authors who disagreed with the portrayal of um, Jesus and the disciples, um, disagreed with the portrayal found in Mark. Um, and I think that they represented um, believers within a Christian community um, at, at the time. So you think, and they wanted to effectively make a different statement about what Christian belief was and how to deal with relevant problems that they were facing as Christians within a church in their day. I mean, like you have to get into the specifics and, and what, what um, you know to be con become convinced of this point of view, but the the particular type of evidence that people use to conclude this is they look at where changes occurred um, in the Matthean account from the Markan account. So they look at the differences between them where Matthew's account diverges and they ask the question, you know, what is it that the author is trying to say and what is it that the author believes that would make them make a change from the text that they're obviously relying on? And what you find is that there's consistencies in the types of changes that they make across the gospel. Um, and those, those consistencies seem to represent like points of view that would at least scholars hypothesize existed within their churches. See, the changes that I think happened in Matthew, Luke, and John um, were, number one, to fix mistakes that Mark did, or 
and when I say mistakes, I mean like just excluding some important things that they thought should have been said to historicize this Jesus person. And um, like, for example, Mark doesn't talk about the birth of Jesus at all. So they thought, oh, we, we need to add this if we want to make Jesus look like a real person. And then Luke read Matthew's account and Mark's account and said, oh, well, wait a minute, this doesn't fit with the prophecy, so I need to put in the census part to make this work. And so I can totally see non-Jews, Greeks, writing the Gospels and not believing a word of it. <laughs> and... Uh, writing a story, a screenplay, and based on the Old Testament and based on Greek literature, and but realizing, oh, in order to make the continuity, continuity perfect, they had to fix these problems. Yeah, but I, I, I don't know. I don't really think so. I, I think that like the like Matthew and Luke more represent like regional differences that existed within Christianity. And then those gospels became the primary gospel that was relied on with the, within those communities. And maybe you're just more cynical than I am. <laughs> but I, I think that, I mean... I think Matthew and Luke, maybe they knew the inside knowledge, like, you know, and kind of, you know, didn't, you know, knew that they were writing, that they were like forging details that weren't true. But I at least think that they did it to make um, a point which was consistent with something that they believed. Um, I think that the changes that they were making were because of the fact that they existed within communities that held those beliefs. And I think that those beliefs probably just came about naturally, like through the course of um, evolution, you know, r religious evolution, like in the same way that you have particular churches in Christianity nowadays that believe different things to one another. Um, I think that, that yeah. <laughs> It's it's probably worth getting into the in, into specifics about you know what was changed and you know what why it would plausibly be changed and maybe you're right like maybe the most plausible explanation is that they didn't believe any of it that they were doing it because making these modifications were somehow crucial in pacifying Jews. Um, and converting more Jews to Christianity. But I don't really think that that's why. I think that, like, I think that the details that they modified were less crucial to making Jews come to believe in Christianity and more crucial to make a consistent portrayal of Jesus, like, sorry, a portrayal of Jesus consistent with what their community believed. I never knew that you disagreed with me on the passion play theory. Well, no, I agree with it when it comes to Mark. Um, I think that Mark like definitely knows that he's writing historical fiction, but I think that he's telling a story that has very strong moral points that are consistent with what he believes about Jesus. I think he's historicizing Jesus in a way to make Jesus's message more vivid and compelling to people. I think that he actually believes in the celestial Jesus, that he believes that Jesus is the road to salvation and that Jesus is the one who died and resurrected for our, um, for our sins and, you know, to redeem us. And, but I just, think he's doing it in a way that like well and th this is that might sound like a crazy view but there's evidence that this was that this happened to um to other figures in history as well that they were historicized in this manner and it's also um like we have evidence that in greek literary education that one of the things that people would do as part of their education is to write um, to write historical stories, effectively like historical fiction, to tell a particular um, 
po- to sell a particular point of view, to um, convey a, a more general truth that was more important than the allegory that they and the historicization that they were using to convey it. Um, and I think that Mark's gospel definitely represents somebody. Um, the the author is selling it for because the author. So do you believe it. Mark? believed he was writing about a real person? I don't think that Mark believed he was writing about events that happened in history um, in the way that he writes it. But I believe that he, you know, in the points that he's making, he believes in the truth of them. For example, when he paints Jesus as um, the replacement for the need of the Jewish cult, um, and the do, the new, um, effectively, like the new connection between God's people and and God. Um, I think that that's because he believed that about Jesus, and I think that he uses historical fiction, like for example, the withering of the fig tree surrounding the cleansing of the temple, as a means to describe to convey the point that the temple cult is no longer necessary because God has sent his, um, you know, a new um, divine, you know, way of, of communicating him, him with him and receiving salvation. What yeah. was the name of the younger Flavian? There was two generals, Flavians. Was it Herod and... I don't know exactly. I, I, I couldn't tell you that. I seem to remember something about, reading something about um, the son, the younger Flavian, married some very prominent Jewish woman. And so now we have a, a Roman ruler, a general, who has access to the wealth of information from the Old Testament through the, his wife. And oh, yeah, that rings bell. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Which would go more in line with my hypothesis that... That's, is, is that the theory that's argued by Joseph Atwell? I'm not sure. I just remember this in my head from... I, I, I think it is. And, well, I mean, I, I haven't actually read Atwell's books, but I have at least, like, listen to and that I respect to have a lot of suspicion about his interpretation of the origins of early Christianity. A lot of skepticism, at least. Um, like Richard Carrier, for example, has um, written quite well en- enough about Atwell. Um, okay. Yeah. But anyway, I mean, the reality is, is that whether or not we have um, a, you know, a way to know exactly how Christianity came about, we don't get to just, um, it's not as if not knowing for sure means that we just assume that the Bible is true. Um, or that he did exist, like. Okay, we should be coming back. Yeah, we're back. Sorry about that, guys. So the point that I was trying to make is um, one thing that people get they find it really hard to understand when it comes to history or at least hard to admit is true is that there's nothing about the world and nothing about the universe that demands or makes it true that we would have all the evidence that we need to know what happened in the past so it's history is actually a very probabilistic field where it can be quite difficult to make Um, certain conclusions about what happened and often the position that we're left in is just simply a position of um of not knowing of agnosticism of having plausible theories about what might be true but not yet 
having evidence that distinguishes between them. So it might well be true that Jesus came about as, you know, what what you could call a conspiracy among um, Roman elites to produce a um, religion that pacified the Jews, um, or it could not be true, and we simply don't have the evidence, maybe we don't have the evidence to distinguish that. Or it might be the case that it came about through, um, you know, a belief in a divine being. <laughs> and, you know, you, it would be worthwhile finding out why he is so confident um, that that theory is not very probable or plausible. But, yeah, the, to emphasize again, when it comes to history, it's a probabilistic field. We don't always have the evidence that we wish that we had, um, and we can't always 